Welcome to the September 2023 meeting of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. FACT began in 1995. We support science, reason, critical thinking, and the thorough investigation of claims using the scientific method. Um, some information about the Zoom meeting. We will have a Q&A at the end of the meeting, but we don't have a separate Q&A box here. So you can type questions into the chat box at any time. Please put a Q before your question so it's easier for me to find it. Today's speaker is Dr. Nathan Lentz. Lentz, I am so sorry, Dr. Lentz, I really can't pronounce your name. Professor of Biology and Director of the Cell and Molecular Biology Program at John Jay College of the City University of New York. In addition, he is the author of two of the best popular science books I've read. One is, let's see, can you see this? Yes, Not So Different, Finding Nature, Finding Human Nature in Animals. It is excellent. Um, and Human Errors, A Panorama of Our Glitches from Pointless Bones to Broken Genes. That's a great book and a wonderful response to the intelligent design people. His next book will be Rewinding Sex, Modern Attitudes, Ancient Truths, and it will come out in 2025. His talk today will be Hacking Humanity, How New Advances in Technology Are Leading to Breakthroughs in health and medicine. So Dr. Lentz, go right ahead. And um, when, when you're finished, it'll take me a few seconds to unmute myself and, and put my picture back up. Okay. Nope. Go. Okay, sounds good. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? I guess I, you yes. can't say anything, but okay, yes. I, I got some thumbs up, so I guess you can hear me. All right. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to now sh uh, share my screen and make sure that uh, heads over to full screen. Um, seamlessly, it should be okay. I think I did it by sharing PowerPoint. And does that, can you see me? Can you see the slides? Can I get a thumbs up? That's, or good. That's good, Nathan. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Um, and um, as you heard, I, I've spoken before about uh, some of what's wrong with uh, human body, human mind, human genome, uh, sort of the mistakes that evolution has left over that we're still plagued with. So it's my pleasure now to kind of look the other way instead of looking backwards uh, and at our physiology and how evolution has shaped us. Um, I, I, this talk will be looking forward a little bit about how we're sort of taking the reins and we're taking control away from evolution and putting it back in our own hands in terms of um, how we are going to evolve and how we're going to change over time. And I hope to do a little debunking in terms of what's possible and what's not in the near term. Um, and I think most people are generally surprised at where we where we are. I mean, and and where some things that are going to be deployed out in the clinic relatively soon. Um, and then I think also people get, tend to be a little bit relieved that some of the things that they're scared of with this kind of technology um, are it's a lot further off than than you might imagine. So I think we're in a in a great space right now, uh, and it's an exciting time to be alive uh, because of some of the science that's going on. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to move on. But I want to I want to um, emphasize one point before I get into the science, and that is that. Taking control of our evolutionary destiny, uh, that's something that has a long tradition in our lineage. We're not really in totally new ground when it comes to taking control of our biology because we have been augmenting our natural abilities um, with, with the, the abilities of our body with tools uh, for a very long time, actually. We've been really extending uh, the reach of our bodies and we've um, sort of refused to live with our limitations. And that really is one of the few things that makes us unique as a species is that we, we um, create our own environment. We don't live in any one kind of environment or any one kind of space. Um, we create it for ourselves. Uh, and, and that's because cultural evolution has really become much more powerful than biological evolution. We don't live and die based on how well our body works. Um, it's it's just we we create the conditions so that we can thrive. And when we move into a new environment, we just simply recreate it uh, to suit us. Uh, and of course, there's some downsides with with that in terms of our trajectory. Uh, but that, this is not that talk today. Today, I'm going to I'm going to tell you more of the happy stories. 
So I want to introduce you to an invention, the technology that really changed everything for our species, probably the most important thing that has ever been invented uh, by human beings. Um, and that is this, this device right here that I'm going to show you. Uh, that's right, the stone tool. So the first generation of stone tools in our lineage are known as hand axes. So this is a uh, uh, a very simple uh, tool in the what's called the Oldowan industry uh, of archaeology. The oldest stone tools that we're aware of look like this. And the reason why I say this changed everything is this is the first beginnings of our species extending the functionality of our body uh, beyond its physical location so that we could do something different than our body, body would normally allow. Just think of every other living thing on the planet. And I know that there are some apes that use tools uh, and, and actually lots of creatures that use tools. Um, but think what that is, is, is refusing to just do what your body allows and instead um, augment your natural abilities uh, with an addition. Uh, and, and, and why this is so different is then the way that natural selection operates on a species that uses one of these is very different because it will then start to lean into that, say, okay, well, if the tool can extend your natural functionality, we're going to, natural selection is going to shape us to be better tool makers, not better whatever it is the tool was doing, right? Uh, and so when you, and once you get, gain that ability to be a better tool maker and teach each other and, and, and have that cumulative construction of knowledge, it really puts you in a different lane uh, in terms of evolution. Uh, and, and, and that kind of evolution, cultural evolution operates at warp speed compared to regular old biological evolution where you just have to wait around for mutations to solve your problems. Uh, now you can solve them intentionally. Uh, and so when, once we began relying on tools, it really it really changed everything. And, and here's another technology that really changed our trajectory, and that is fire. And what is fire but an, an extension of our digestive system? We now pre-digest our food uh, before we ingest it. And again, that changes the way that our body um, uh, interacts with the environment when it comes to food. We're not limited to what we can find. We, uh, we're, we're, we can eat a whole new kinds of food by cooking them. Uh, and it really puts us in a new trajectory. And of course, food is a big part of how we evolve culturally too. If you look at all of these, these uh, foods that you see there, you probably don't recognize any of these. Um, but actually, you eat the descendants of these all of the time. We shaped our food. We don't just eat the food that's there. We reshape it and we domesticate it and we make it more palatable, more sweet, more nutritious. Uh, and of course, way more calorific, which is, of course, a big problem with us now. Uh, but in the early days, it, it really put us in a, a whole new tra trajectory. And it wasn't just plants. Of course, we changed the animals around us, too. We looked around at the various animals we interacted with and we said, how could we uh, use those as an extension of our body? If you imagine a human trying to um, plow a field, well, even without tools, um, you know, a or working without tools, a human couldn't get anywhere. Well, if we start to invent tools, well, we can get a little further. But what about a tool that's pulled by an animal that we've domesticated? Um, you know, all kinds of things become possible. And we're really not in the realm of biological evolution anymore. There aren't mutations that drive this. It's just simply our mind and our sociality that drives our uh, trajectory. And in fact, some often have have come to to question whether or not um, we domesticated these animals, or rather, they domesticated themselves. Um, and 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 who's really taking advantage of whom here? You see, my dog here has been um, conditioned uh, to use me as his pillow. So it's 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 hard to say that it's really hard to say to see who's serving who here when it comes to uh, domestication of, of plants and animals, because the animals we domesticate then do quite well for themselves. Um, anyway. So if you can think of all kinds of extensions of our bodies, uh, whether it comes to our vision, uh, what we do with our arms and our hands, how we hunt, where we can live, um, you know, how we interact with the environment. It's just all the rules are different once you start using tools. And so we're really in a different trajectory. We're in a different uh, uh, way of living and interacting with our environment. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is mostly in the, in the realm of health and disease and just the regular functioning of our body. How can we um, sort of fix some of the errors that we have left over for evolution, or rather, how can we fix some of the things that plague us in one way or another that still hold us back? 
And we're going to talk about areas within our immune system. We're going to talk about our, our genetics and genetic diseases uh, and other kinds of diseases. We'll talk about how we can alter and augment our own anatomy and even our sensation and perception. Um, like, for example, there are sensation perception systems that we don't even have as human beings. Uh, I'm thinking mostly like of echolocation. There's other forms of sensation that we're not capable of. For example, birds detect magnetic fields um, and they do it with their eyes, uh, interestingly. So it, it, one thing I've always thought about is I wonder if they can actually see it, if they have a perception of it or whether it's unconscious. We don't know. But the thing is, is we, we've we already done that, right? We've invented tools that can measure the magnetic field. We've invented radar. We've invented all kinds of things to enhance our senses. Um, and this is just going to continue. And then, of course, the ultimate challenge of all is um, is attacking the beast that stalks us all, and that is um, aging and our own mortality. A lot of uh, what what um, comes comes about from human psychology is uh, us contemplating our own mortality and what we do with that information, how we live our lives, both as a species and as individuals. So we'll talk about the ultimate uh, challenge, which is stopping aging altogether. Whether or not that's good or bad, is that's a topic for the, maybe your next talk will be a philosopher. Uh, I'm just here to talk a little bit about the science, about how if uh, how that kind of research proceeds, and if we we do tackle it, how that how that might be. Um, okay, so let's begin with our immune system. This is the word, uh, the reason I start here with a talk like this is that we've already been doing this. We've actually been doing this for hundreds of years. Um, the first vaccines uh, did not involve uh, you know syringes and injections, but rather there are human populations around the world that have intentionally exposed themselves to things like cowpox. Uh, because they recognized that it then gave you immunity and resistance to smallpox. Uh, that's just one example. But we've actually deliberate inoculation even precedes Jonas Salk and, and the uh, uh, the invention of, of modern vaccines as we know them. But actually deliberate inoculation goes back several hundred years and was invented many places around the globe. This was not just the product of Western science, uh, you know, in the 20th century. Um, so the idea that, and the idea of what an inoculation is, is you pre-expose the body to some antigens. Well, they'll actually develop a sort of a, a form of pre-immunity so that the second time that you see that exposure, that the antibodies are already in place. And usually what it means is that you wouldn't get an infection in the first place. And the reason this works is that the first time you see an infection, it takes really two weeks to get maximal antibody production. And that's because um, the, the, the antibodies that will respond represent a tiny minority of the potential antibodies that you have. Well, once those have been expanded and selected for, uh, you end up, after you've cleared the infection, you end up with reserve cells uh, to create those antibodies. And that gives you a much stronger starting point so that the next time you see that same antigen, you get a faster, larger, more robust response, such to the point that the infection will never take hold. Well, once we realized how that works intuitively, before we knew what antibodies were, we under had an understanding about infection and inoculation. We were able to hack that. But of course, what have we done uh, beginning in 2020 and until now is, well, well, what about, can we make this step even better? Well, we, we did. The vaccinations now, we don't actually give the antigen. We give the genetic instructions to make the antigen. And we inject those into our muscle cells and our own cells then begin to make the antigen. And that's why vaccines, for, for example, for COVID, uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2 are so much more effective uh, than precursor vaccines are, is that you your own cells begin to make this antigen and they make it in large numbers and in great quantities so that you can get a more robust immune response. And the immune response that we see with the COVID uh, vaccines um, have been absolutely incredible in terms of how well they've protected individuals. Somehow people are skeptical of this still. But when the COVID vaccines were first introduced, I remember many of us scientists who understood that this mRNA technology, it was the first time it was really being deployed. We were actually quite nervous because anytime you take something that looks great in a lab and then you deploy it, uh, out in the population, lots of things can happen that you didn't expect. So a lot of us were quite nervous to see how well it would work. But the bottom line is it has been safer and more effective than we even could have predicted. It was, it's, it's been a smashing success of, of uh, immune technology. Um, and somehow 
somehow <laughs> people are skeptical of these vaccines, even though, like I said, they exceeded all of our expectations. Um, but we can take this even further. So this is this is what you use to attack or, or to pre-defend uh, yourself against an attacker, against an invader. But what about other kinds of diseases? Could, could we actually train our, our immune system to do other kinds of uh, diseases for us? And the ex example is yes, and we're actually we're very, very close. So we now know that um, one of the, the a key part of the disease etiology for multiple sclerosis involves an immune response. Well, that means it, it's something that we might be able to tweak. Well, in um, this is in mice. They have done experiments where they actually um, have created an, an mRNA vaccine against uh, the the immune response itself that that uh, causes multiple sclerosis, and you can see within days you get um, much attenuated response. So if you have, and, and you can see the controls, uh, two types of controls, and you see a much attenuated immune response here. And this is the kind of difference that could uh, give a patient with multiple sclerosis give them their life back. Um, and so the mRNA vaccines for certain autoimmune diseases are right around the corner. This is something that we're going to see deployed. Uh, in the human population in phase one trials, um, either this year or next year. Uh, so it won't be long before we have true intelligent treatments uh, for things like multiple sclerosis. I also want to show you, uh, this is now not in a um, in a mouse, this is actually in a human. We've also trained the immune system to go after certain kinds of cancer. So if you take a cancer like melanoma, melanoma is a good one for this kind of trial because it tends to generate some proteins that are that are unique to it. One of the problems with cancer has always been, how do you kill cells that are your own cells? These are regular cells from you. So um, it's very hard to, to get treatments that'll kill the cancer without killing you. You know, what can we make something that's uniquely toxic to the cancer cell? Well, melanoma does have some of these uh, proteins that end up fairly unique to it. Well, this is a patient who, uh, and if you look at the time trial with conventional chemotherapy, um, this particular um, patient is not is not had not been responding. So this patient is we can think of them as as terminal. So it, it's failed to uh, chemotherapy has failed to do the job. But when we vaccinate, and you can see this too, because with treatments with chemical chemotherapy, you can see that the tumor did not get any smaller. And this is in the lung, so it's melanoma that has metastasized to the lung. So you can know that usually stage four that and that automatically makes it stage four. Um, generally, this is this is something that the pa patient will have forever and, and, and likely end up eventually dying of this. Uh, and you can see that with this tumor no longer responding to this chemotherapy, this, days, this patient's um, days are numbered. Well, with a treatment with a, an mRNA vaccine against the, the exact melanoma that this patient has, you can see regression of the tumor in a relatively short amount of time. And at the time that this paper was published, this patient was still alive. Um, and as far as I know, the patient still is alive. And I, I have signed up for updates from this research group. Um, so this is a patient that probably would have been dead, um, you know, by in 2019 and is still alive because of a vaccination that they've received against their own melanoma. And we're going to take this even further. What if we what if we were to take T cells from you, your own natural killer cells? Actually, natural killer cells are a different kind of lymphocyte, but uh, T cells, which are killer uh, in their in their uh, orientation, killer T cells. We can take those and then reprogram them to attack whatever cell we want. Once we learn um, how the T cell can attack and, and be targeted, we can then provide, take your cells, program them and send them back to you. And once again, this is not science fiction. More than 10 years ago, a patient was treated uh, against a, a type of leukemia um, and, and that was that had set up in the bone marrow. And they can see six months with a single T cell treatment. After six months, you see completely disappearance of the cancer. So these T cells have been reprogrammed to, to identify it, their own cancer cells. And, and you can see that this is this has been successful. So here's another technology where we take natural killer cells, which is a different kind of lymphocyte, and train them. Um, so the green cells here are not the natural killer cells. These are the targets. I'm going to play a video now. So these are the cells that are going to be targeted. And this is in, in tissue culture. But you take a cell, a T cell, and train it against the green fluorescent protein. And watch what happens when this cell finds it. Okay. Here's our program cell right there, that little guy. Watch what happens. Boom. I'm going to play this one more time. So here's the little guy right here. This is the Jedi cells, it's called. And here's his target. 
Imagine that that is a cancer cell. So this is the kind of technology where we can target and train cells to go in and do specific kinds of jobs for us. Um, and I think you're gonna see that um, coming to the clinic uh, very soon. Now that genetic engineering has become so easy, um, you're gonna see this deployed um, in more places. Let's, let's, let's go on to the next slide here. Um, so, and, and this introduces the concept of just simply hacking our own genes. Well, why would we want to hack our own genes? And again, don't talk, no one's talking about designer babies here or trying to make you smarter or faster or better looking. I'm just talking about individuals who suffer from genetic diseases. Let's just begin there. There's really no ethical questions about whether or not we should treat these people. So the diseases that are caused by um, a variant in a single gene, they're called rare diseases. Yes, each one is rare, but if you count up all the people who have one of these, over 200 million people on the planet um, have some kind of rare genetic disease. And some of the more famous ones are sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, the most popular, or not most popular, the most prevalent form of muscular dystrophy, Tay-Sachs disease, beta thalassemia, uh, thalassemia and hereditary uh, transthyretin amyloidosis. And I'm going to give you, talk a little bit more about this one. I mentioned these because these are the most common in the United States, but these diseases are caused by a variant in a single gene. So one gene and generally one tissue that's affected. So I call this the low hanging fruit when it comes to genetic diseases, because all we have to do is fix one gene and one tissue. Cystic fibrosis, of course, affects a couple of tissues, but really if we can solve the problem in the lungs, everything else becomes more manageable. So one gene, one tissue, these are the, the low hanging fruit of genetic diseases. So let me tell you some stories about where we are with this. Gene therapy has been incredibly elusive. Those of you who remember, in the, uh, even as far back as the 80s, but certainly through the 1990s, um, a lot of interest was in gene therapy. How can we fix G by giving people genes? And a couple of early trials were disastrous. There was a, a patient that was giving a P53 gene uh, as a potential, and this was a healthy volunteer. It was phase one trial. So this, this kid, young kid who had nothing wrong with him, goes to the hospital, volunteer for medical studies, and he was given a, vaccine, a, a, a virus to deliver the P53 gene, and he had an anaphylactic immune response and died within minutes. And unfortunately, that paused research really set us back a decade because people realized that this is a lot more dangerous than we thought. The good news is we've been able to figure out how to do this without any viruses. So the major barrier was delivery, safe delivery of this technology. And we've now figured out how to do this without. And I'm talking about CRISPR-Cas9. Probably most of you being who you are uh, have heard of CRISPR. So CRISPR is a gene editing technology that has changed everything because it's fast, it's cheap, it's easy, it's safe. Um, it really took gene editing and, and gene manipulation into a whole new world. It, things that were not even conceivable 15 years ago are now done on a daily basis. It's really, I can't, I can't say much. Uh, it says too much about how it's revolutionized how we do this. Um, I don't, we don't have to go into all of, of how it works, but it's really just as simple as providing a small sequence and then the Cas9 protein, and it will come in and replace the the, the uh, target sequence with the sequence that you wish. So the edited sequence. So you can do uh, to fix something, you can insert something, or you can delete something at will anywhere you want in the genome fairly relatively safely. So let's just give an example of the first time that I'm aware of that this was used in a patient. So this study was published in 2021. And they took patients that have this disease called transthyretin amyloidosis. What happens with this disease is the liver starts making too much of a protein called transthyretin, which you really don't need anyway. And it, it, it you make too much of it and it misfolds and it gets put into the bloodstream where it causes problems in the heart. So it's your own body just doing something it shouldn't do, at least too much of what it, it shouldn't do. And so um, this is a good target, good um candidate for gene therapy, because all we have to do is inactivate a gene. It's very easy to inactivate a gene. There's lots of ways to do it. And only in one tissue, and that tissue being the liver. And the liver is actually a really good one too, because the liver is easy to get to uh, using your circulation, because as, as you may or may not know, uh, you have, have the hepatic circulation where everything you absorb uh, from your in the GI tract does a first pass metabolism through the liver before it's released to the body. So it kind of scans uh, for anything crazy in there. So it's actually very easy to get, to target the liver with gene therapy. So this is the liver and a single gene, and all we're doing is inactivating it. 
So let's see how this works. So in theory, it should be very simple. Well, if you look at the context concentration of transthyretin um, in the patient. So you have a control patient and you begin at 100%. So whatever level they were at, you, you call that, uh, you know, one or a hundred percent. And obviously if you don't treat them with anything, uh, their levels of transthyretin stay high in their blood. And these patients would be suffering from the disease. But if you, in a dose dependent manner, you can knock out uh, expression of this gene with a single treatment, a single treatment, because it's genetic. We've changed that. Okay, so if you do a low dose versus two high doses, um, you can actually delete this gene in the liver, uh, not delete, but inactivate this gene in the liver such that they are not producing very much transthyretin. And this is more than enough uh, suppression to see the disease go away. And that's exactly what they found. So these patients with a single treatment were cured. So the first people who have been cured of a genetic disease are walking among us and they no longer have this as a problem. This is a fairly fairly rare disease. Uh, so let's talk about some, some that are more common. So there's two other diseases that are good targets for gene therapy, um, and they kill a lot more people. So sickle cell disease um, affects millions upon millions, probably tens of millions of, of individuals around the planet have this disease. And why it's so common is a, actually a story I cover in, in, in Human Errors, my last book. Um, it's, it's interesting. But anyway, beta thalassemia is another disease. Both of these have something in common, and that is that misshapen hemoglobin is the problem. So it's the alpha chain in sickle cell anemia the beta chain and thalassemia, but the, the, the result is the same. Essentially, you have misfolded hemoglobin, which leads to misfolded red blood cells, which then can get stuck in, in uh, small vessels like capillaries and so forth. So these misfolded hemoglobin causes problems uh, for individuals to have it. Well, the reason why I say these two, two diseases are prime candidates for a genetic cure is because we actually don't have to fix either the alpha chain or the beta chain. We have a third chain um, of hemoglobin called the gamma hemoglobin that is very present in fetuses. So, so the developing embryos, as they get their own uh, circulation, they become a, an embryo transitions to a fetus and it starts to have its own heart and its own blood supply, but it has a different form of hemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen. Why does it have that? In order to steal oxygen away from the mother because they don't have direct access to room air. So they have to have a very aggressive oxygen binder in order to get uh, the oxygen, steal the oxygen away from their mother. So that, but that gene slowly turns off after you're born. So once we're born, beta, uh, sorry, gamma hemoglobin sort of goes away, gamma glo uh, globin, and then it gets replaced with what we call adult hemoglobin, alpha and beta. Well, if these patients have something wrong with either alpha or beta, Maybe we could do this by just simply turning their phenohemoglobin back on. Could we turn that gene back on and, and cure these people? You probably know where I'm going with this, but let's see the data itself. So, so here uh, we have the patient where we're just going to measure phenohemoglobin, that gamma globul globulin form, uh, gamma globin form. So this is a single infusion of a transgene that just simply turns on this gene in the bone marrow. And you can see that after an infusion, they have very low, almost undetectable amounts of uh, circulating um, fetal hemoglobin. So this is the count here is number of cells that have detectable fetal hemoglobin. That's that's the way they do it. So there's very little fetal, he, fetal hemoglobin before you treat them, obviously. But you turn this gene on and relatively quickly, within two months, three months, certainly by four months, you have most of the hemoglobin in these patients contains fetal hemoglobin, which will then fold properly. There's nothing wrong with their gamma uh, globin genes at the alpha or beta. So these are these are normal, healthy patients that we've just been able to trick to turn their fetal hemoglobin on. And here's now the data. This is a patient that has beta thalassemia, and this is how often they needed transfusion. So in this time period of their life, this is before they entered the studies, so they found this from medical records, uh, to, for 2.4 years, how often they needed a blood transfusion. They were screened, and this is the pre, um, you know, following the study, how often they needed their blood transfusion. And then here, if we zoom in, in the 30 days after their blood transfusion, or after uh, the single dose of the transgene to turn on fetal hemoglobin, you can see they needed a couple of transfusions, and now, almost two years later, they are free of the need for transfusions. So these patients have now been cured of beta thalassemia. They walk among us with from a single treatment. They no longer have this genetic disease that used to require constant transfusions. Why? Because we were able to genetically change their own hemoglobin genes. 
Now, this is inheritable, so it could still be passed on, right? We're not changing anything in the ovaries or sperm cells of, of these individuals. However, um, as this gets to be more routine, if someone's born with beta thalassemia, oh, just give them, just like we get, you get your inoculations and your shots now, one day you'll be given a shot for that too, uh, if you're born with beta thalassemia. So let's let's look at sickle cell anemia. So the same kind of study was done, the same transgene that was done. All we need to do, hopefully, is turn on phenohemoglobin for these patients. You can see within a few months, um, uh, the patients with sickle cell anemia, we were able to turn on their phenohemoglobin. What kind of difference did it make? Well, in this chart here, these are how often this patient got transfusion. Up here, are these yellow dots, or sorry, red dots here, shows how often this particular patient um, had to be hospitalized uh, for sickle cell crisis. So you can see just how common sickle cell crisis is in these in these individuals. A single transfusion, uh, or sorry, infusion of the transgene to turn on phenyl hemoglobin, and you can see within a couple of months, no more transfusions and not a single, not a single sickle cell crisis from the point of infusion onwards. So these patients have been cured. All right. So in, with anybody who talks too much about banning gene editing and and, um, you know, refusing to to allow research on, on genetic. Just remember, there's some really important babies in the bathwater here. And those babies in the bathwater are people like Victoria Gray, who previously um, had a debilitating disease that really limited what she could do in life because of how often she was subjected to these crises. She now hasn't had a crisis since. She doesn't need transfusion. She's got her life back and she, she you know, the, the sky's the limit. So if you ask Victoria Gray whether or not we should be doing um, gene editing, I think you'll get a very, very clear answer. Um, and of course, now we're moving on to other things. So what about a monogenic disease that affects the lung? Obviously, what we're talking about here is cystic fibrosis. So we are now moving towards that in animal studies. And of course, even with human organoids, so these are um, pieces of organs, so to speak, that we grow in the lab, we've been able to successfully replace the CFTR gene that is defective. So we, we have organoids from patients who have cystic fibrosis. So in vitro, we've been able to fix this gene. And what, when, what that tells us is is we're we're ready. Uh, we're ready, and and in fact, the the first trials to cure cystic fibrosis have already begun. Uh, we do have to target the lung, which is not quite as easy as other tissues like the lung, like the bone marrow and the liver. Uh, but the lung is a little bit harder, and we also eventually have to get to the pancreas because individuals with cystic fibrosis also have have trouble with their pancreas. Um, but you can just tell it's just a matter of time before we've had uh, you know we have our first. Um, patients uh, cured of these diseases. And really, you name it, you can see, um, you know, obviously the ones with a single disease are the ones we're going to go after first, but even much more um, complex genetic diseases, things like glaucoma, Parkinson's disease, uh, they're looking at Alzheimer's, you know, heart disease, various kinds of heart disease. So it's really the sky's the limit. If, if genes are involved in the etiology of a certain disease, you can bet there are research teams working on this right now. And because and, and, and I know that we've been promising cures on all these things for a long time, but it's I just can't emphasize enough how much has changed with CRISPR technology and our ability to target individual tissues. Um, the technology has really caught up to the theory, and we have all the tools we need now to do this. Uh, now, hopefully we're doing it safely and, and so forth, but um, that's that's where we're going. Okay, so I know that in an audience like this, you want science. You want the hard uh, science, debunking the, the mythology, and keep us out of the realm of science fiction. However, I also know that any science-interested crowd also does enjoy a little science fiction. So I think we can depart for just a couple of minutes and see where we could go with this in a more distant future. So could we really just hack our way through our bo bodies genetically? Well, the answer is probably some of this is going to be possible in the short term. So you think about things like superhuman strength. How could you make an individual who has just abnormally large muscles? Well, once again, that's a single organ type, a single tissue type. And if there are individual genes that are easy to manipulate um, that could be responsible for large muscle growth, then we might be able to do this. And it turns out there is. In fact, there have been spontaneous mutants found of the myostatin gene. So if you just simply uh, have a couple of, of, of kinds of mutations that will inhibit the activity of myostatin, then myost these the individuals grow very large skeletal muscles. And cows and dogs have been found. So these are litter mates, um, even though they don't look like it. But this dog has actually um, has a mutated version of myostatin. And in fact, spontaneous mutants have even been found 
in humans. So there are humans today, alive today through no manipulation, who have very strong muscles, super superhuman strength, even without too much training. And this is because of a mutation in their myostatin gene. So if we can detect these mutations, and now we're able to do genetic technology, gene editing technology, could we actually edit someone's genes to give them the superhuman strength? Well, delivery would be an issue right now because delivering it all over the body to every muscle might be an issue, but you can see that this is just a technical challenge. So the idea, if we wanted to make, if we wanted to make superhuman, uh, humans with superhuman strength, we, we could do that. Um, well, what about things like endurance, like your ability to run without uh, needing rest and things like this? We know that there's some um, genetics components that could be manipulated here because we've done it with so many of our, of our domesticated animals. If you look at how much draft animals uh, can, how hard they can work before they need a recharge, it's really, it's, 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 it's orders of magnitude more than their pre-domesticated uh, ancestors. So we know this can be done. Uh, well, it turns out there are actually even humans, spontaneous mutants uh, in the human population who have who have had this ability. Now, there's this a gentleman, a, a skier from the 1960s and 70s. Um, he's from uh, Denmark, I believe. He's definitely Nordic country. I can't remember which country it is. I think there's his name. I won't even try to say it. But this is the this is an individual. He he was found to be a spontaneous mutant of the erythropoietin gene or EPO. And someone who has as much EPO as he has has a much higher hematocrit. So he has more red blood cells per unit volume in his blood. So he has kind of supercharged blood in terms of oxygen delivery. And for that reason, he won all kinds of gold medals. Um, and this was just a natural spontaneous change in his um, uh, composition. Um, so he was never, by the way, none of his medals were ever removed for doping because um, because this is a natural variation. Now he, he died before the era of doping. Um, but he, if this is his natural variation, he couldn't be accused of doping. But if you use EPO, it's one of the drugs that, that they look for uh, in doping because it does give you this incredible endurance. So if you have a spontaneous mutation, it's fine. If you use artificial manipulation, you're not. Um, okay. So now let's look at um, what about bones? Wouldn't it be great to have humans who have these super hard bones? And as our population is aging, osteoporosis is an even larger problem um, uh, than, than it's been in the past. But even just there's certain jobs and, and professions where having superhuman um, unbreakable bones would be beneficial. Well, those spontaneous mutants have been found too. There are individuals alive today who have unusually hard bones with, by the way, no other side effects. So they don't have... Uh, it's not part of a suite of symptoms that 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 in which they're they have less functionality elsewhere. But there have been spontaneous mutants of two different genes that we found who have exceptionally hard bones. Well, wouldn't that be great if we could deliver that further? Um, what about superhuman vision? Well, it turns out, again, there are individuals who naturally have a better vision than the rest of us. And this is through something called tetrachromacy. So we have, as humans, we have three kinds of color detectors, three cones in our retina. And each one of those detects, you know, it kind of specializes in a different region of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, the, the far red to far blue, that's the spectrum. And we have three cones that kind of overlap and cover different parts of the spectrum. And that gives us much better color vision, by the way, than most other mammals. Most other mammals only have two. So your dog and your cat, they're not quite colorblind, but they don't see near the rich richness of colors that we see because they only have two, whereas we have three. Well, there are some humans alive today that have four. Um, and, and so there, and so instead of having just one, two, three areas of the spectrum, they have a fourth area of the spectrum that's covered by a different photo detector. So they would have, they would, they'd be able to discriminate even rich, even more rich uh, color discrimination in that region. Um, so these are the wavelengths of light that they're that they would specialize in, and it, and it's telling that these mutants are within an area that we don't cover very well. So this is in a, a part of the spectrum in that blue to green area uh, where we would actually benefit from a fourth color detector. So these tetrachromats, by the way, every single one of them, every single one of the tetrachromats that have been discovered are women, and this is because these genes are on the X chromosome. And one of them um, is, is, has been duplicated in those individuals and it's, it's still linked to the other one. So they have a grand total of four color detectors, whereas the rest of us only have three. 
Okay. Um, what about the sh- superhuman sense of smell? Well, there, are, and that's called hyperosmia. Well, there are individuals who are mutants in this gene, Cal one, who can, who have incredibly sensitive uh, senses of smell, and not just where where they can smell something at, in low concentration. They also can discriminate senses. A lot of these individuals, when they're identified, work for the government, uh, for law enforcement, because um, you know, the, even more than trained dogs, they can they can hone in on scents, and once they learn them, they can spot. Uh, it's incredible. If you ever seen the beginning of the movie. Um, I think it's Hannibal. It's the movie. It's one of the movies about Hannibal Lecter. Um, yeah, I think it's Hannibal. Uh, and they're, one of the opening scenes, it talks about um, how uh, someone, an investigator who's employed by um, the, I guess it's the FBI, is able to discriminate a particular perfume scent from a particular shop in Florence, Italy. And that's how good some of them are. That, that's, of course, a work of fiction, but it's based on reality. Um, so, it, again, these are genes that we might be able to deploy and give to people um, if we wish. Um, in the future. This is the science fiction part of this talk, and I'll I'll go get back to reality here in a second. But it just goes to show you that this stuff isn't that far off. We're getting there theoretically, and as the technology for delivery catches up, some of the stuff may be possible. There are also people who are what we call short sleepers. So they have a a, um, mutation in, in the DEC2 gene that allows them to survive and thrive on just three hours of sleep a day. And I know this personally because my PhD advisor was one of them, as was his mother. It was an inherited allele, of course. And my boss, he never slept more than three hours a night, ever. And he never needed to. He woke up and he was always, ref- and he was one of the most energetic men I know. He's now over 80 degrees and he still jogs every morning. Uh, and when I say morning, morning for him is 3.30 a.m. That's when he starts his day. Um, and he goes for a couple of mile jogs every morning at the age of 80. So he's in good shape. It has It has not slowed him down. And um, what if we could all have this gene and we would get back three or four hours every day? I mean, I enjoy sleeping, but it would be great if I felt rested and refreshed after just three hours. Wouldn't we all love another three hours, three to four hours of our day? Uh, Imagine what we could accomplish. Or of course, uh, in our society now, we'd all be expected to produce something with that time rather than just relaxing. But uh, I digress. Okay, so now this talk, this slide, when I talk about these kind of things, generally people get a little uncomfortable because it sounds like I'm going to, into the eugenics route and designer babies. And that is a real legitimate concern. These are very, um, let, let me just assuage you a little bit. Some of these, all of these here are very specific examples of a single gene affecting a single trait. And it's that simple. In those cases, it's relatively safe to make changes. But in all of the kinds of things that you talk about with designer babies, things like intelligence or height or attractiveness, physical fitness, any trait you can think of that you would actually care about, you know, that eugenicists would be into, the genetics of it is so complicated, involving so many genes that we wouldn't even know where to start. There isn't even a theoretical uh, grounds for that. So it's not very far off. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not very uh, a legitimate worry anytime soon. And let me just, I'll give you two examples that I think will help, help you understand um, that it's really not the danger. First of all, um, if you don't want to a human height, let's say we want to make humans taller. You want to design your baby who is taller. Well, do you know how many genes affect human height? How many genes are involved in the process of making you as tall as you are? And this is just the genetic side, right? Not counting environment and uh, you know every in epigenetics, everything that happens to you once you're alive. But just the genetics of it, we know that over 800 genes are involved in human height. Okay, so that's not anything like cystic fibrosis, where it's a single gene, single tissue, right? Human height is affected by 800 genes that we know of. And and we also know that that only covers less than half of the genetic component of it. So there's another 800 or 1,000 that we don't even know what they are. And, and this is the key part, all of those genes affect other things. So you can't just go in tweaking genes and then hoping for the best. Because when that happens, it almost always leads to something bad. In the examples I've given you up till now, it's a single gene with a single function and a single tissue. So it's safe, safer uh, to, to uh, manipulate. And of course, we have to be very careful with all of those. But that's a far cry from these multigenic traits like intelligence and attractiveness and even simple things like height and weight and physical fitness. So many different things are involved that we are nowhere near even knowing how to manipulate, let alone, uh, you know, trying that out and affecting all kinds of tissues in ways that we can't predict. So let me, so that's the one 
thing I say to, to assuage you a little bit. But the next thing I'll say is, and here's an example of how things can go wrong when you want to just tr- you know tweak traits at will. In the 1950s, 1940s and 50s, farmers in the United States, chicken farmers, decided they wanted bigger chickens. They thought that would be a great way to make money is why don't we make our chickens bigger by just breeding the large ones with each other and until we get the chickens larger and larger and larger. But they knew that if you do that, you're going to get inbred very quickly. So these farmers, this is mostly in in New England and, and, and the Northeast. They had a, an exchange program, a breeding exchange program. So these farmers got together. They exchanged each other's biggest birds, let them you know, mate and, and to try to keep the gene pool diversified because they knew that inbreeding was bad. And they had this thing and they did rounds of selection to make the chickens bigger and bigger. And at first it worked. Their yields went up, size of the chicken went up. They got bigger and bigger birds, but it did not last long. And pretty soon their yields actually went down. Even though the chickens got bigger, the yields went down because do you know what happened? These large, large, larger chickens started pecking each other to death and pecking themselves to death. Because if you select for large bodies, you also accidentally select for aggressive behavior in birds that will always come along for the ride for reasons that you can probably, some of which we probably have a good understanding of others. We probably don't. And I tell that story because it will every experiment along this lines has ended up with that, where you end up with some effect that you didn't want and didn't care about, but that causes you problems. And that will happen if we try to just breed people taller and taller or use genetic manipulation to make them taller and taller. It will, I guarantee you, lead to undesirable effects. And everybody who understands genetics and how that genetics works in an organism would say the same thing. So we're not really anywhere close to designer babies just because we are close to genetic cure. So I just want you to make make you feel a little bit better about that. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about when it comes to hacking our bodies is brain computer interfaces because the last 10 years have seen enormous progress on this as well. And artificial intelligence and and the tools that AI uh, have made available to us has been a big part of the breakthrough. And one of the key things that we always had was we were trying to map brain function and try to understand what the brain does and what parts and whatever, learn about it with one person and it would look different with everyone else. And then we realized if we want to build an interface, we actually don't have to know every part of the brain and what it does. What we have to do is understand what it looks like when that brain does the thing that we're trying to interface with. What I mean is to understand how any brain speaks the word car, it'll never translate from person to person. And that was what our our big mistake was. Now we've realized, oh, what we need to do is see how this person's brain says the word car and then just recreate that or rather learn to detect that when it happens again. So it's all a matter of training. So we have these ability to map the brain and then you just have to train it and say, say this, do that, think this. And then once we see the pattern, we don't have to know what parts of the brain are involved. We just have to be able to recognize that pattern when it happens again. Let me show you what I mean. So here's just a simple video. I hope you have the uh, sound. Depending on what electrode they stimulate on, there are different sensations I can feel across different points on my hand. So sometimes it's pressure, sometimes it's just a single warmth. The first time it was really cool. It's kind of like, did that really just happen? Now it's just second nature. When I was 18, I was in a car accident and broke my neck. So now I'm a C5 quadriplegic. When I was in the hospital in Pittsburgh, they put me on a research registry. So they gave me a call and were like, hey, we think you might be interested in this. And I was like, the uh, robots are cool, so. Nathan first volunteered for surgery, so he had to go in and have neurosurgery and spend a week in the hospital. Uh, After he recovered from the neurosurgery, he's pretty much been coming here three times a week. He spends four or five hours here each time he comes. He has been implanted with both microelectrode arrays in his motor and somatosensory cortex. Uh, You can see that we're recording neural signals from the motor cortex, and we are decoding these signals. So that you can control a robotic arm. 
Essentially, he thinks about moving his arm, moving his hand. And so different neurons will be more or less active as he thinks about moving in different directions. And as we record from a whole population of those neurons, we can essentially decode which direction he's thinking about, whether he's thinking about opening or closing the hand, moving his wrist, and turn that into a control signal for the robot. Everybody in the room is passing me, and everybody who's been involved in this project has a goal to cure paralysis in one form or another. In the very beginning, you said, you know, if no one does this, then we're going to advance. I know that when people have a traumatic injury, they, they don't feel like their lives are ruined. They, one day, there will be cures for things like spinal cord injury. If you have lost a limb, you can get one that may be even better than the one you had before. So you can see what they've done is uh, they they have devices that, that can measure his brain activity and they tell him, think about moving your arm in this way. Think about moving your index finger. Think about that. And they and as he as he makes the will to move that, they capture that. And then when he wants to do it again, they recognize that and translate that into motion. Now, obviously, you'll have to this will be a long training procedure, but you can see where this is going. Now, this is with a patient moving a robotic arm. What about restoring function to the arm that you already have? Well, we're working on that, too. Same concept, measuring these things in the brain and letting them play out. I never had to think about moving my hand. It was just something that naturally happened. But today, with practice, I'm able to pick up an object and manipulate that around in space. You know, we've done everything from picking up a bottle and pouring it to playing Guitar Hero and just being able to control more of your body that I thought I had lost forever. Is something that's really exciting and really promising. So, um, and you'll notice that the electrodes are bypassing his spinal cord altogether. Collect information is collected from the brain and then sent to electrodes in his arm. Um, so they're sort of bypassing that those connections because that's the connection that was lost. His brain is fine. His arm is fine. It's the connection between them that is being replaced. Um, well, what about individuals uh, with who are locked in completely, who can't even form words, which it would be hard to train someone, but it can be done. And let's let's see let's see some videos on that. Oops. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Th there's no video studies from that. But what they have is um, once again they train the person and they say think this word, and then they learn what it looks like in his brain when he thinks the word how, or in this case I. Okay, now think the word am, and he'll think the word am as hard as he can, and they collect those signals. Think the word very, and this is how you train it, step by step. Now, this sounds like it would take a very long time, and of course it does, but didn't it take a long time to learn to speak in the first place? It's sort of the same idea. We have to learn and recognize. However, with artificial intelligence, it won't. there won't have to be a technician involved necessarily every step of the way. Um, this will be more and more automated as time goes on. Now, the last thing, as I mentioned, that we're going to tr try to attack when it comes to extending uh, human lifespan is aging itself. Because as most people don't really under uh, probably understand, we're actually programmed to get old. We are programmed to age. It's, it is a time-dependent factor, and it's the accumulation of DNA damage, uh, protein damage too, but mostly accumulation of DNA damage. So you might say, well, how, that's not programmed. That'll just happen. Yes, it does, but we have DNA repair enzymes that keep that at check, and those can be dialed up or dialed down. Could we ever theoretically completely stop aging? Probably not because the DNA damage apparatus itself starts to get damaged and then you know you get a waterfall you know a spiral downward spiral from there and that is how aging works essentially your ability to, to correct uh, the damage goes away um however 
we could edit that uh, too. And so actually we have an idea of if we were to make our DNA repair as optimized as it could be. So this is not without, this is no more manipulation than just simply giving us the best possible DNA damage response and DNA correction. Then we found a theoretical lifespan of about 150 years. And so I would say within the next two or three decades, we'll be deploying technology to allow everyone to at least live the theoretical maximum, which is this, you see different numbers, but it's between 120 to 150 years, which is almost double uh, the current lifespan. So I think within our children's lifespan or or their children, I think that we'll be raising the average age uh, well into the 100s. And this is with functionality. I don't just mean that we get old and then we just don't die for another 100 years. I mean that the whole aging process itself would slow down. Now, of course, where are we going to put all these people, all these people? is another problem. Um, But the reason I I, I bring this up is it is another evolutionary story. We are programmed to get get old and die. And the reason why is that any species um, that has too long of a generation time is not very adaptable because adaptation comes through new mutations, new individuals interacting with the environment, and then you have winners and losers. If you have the same population with its same fixed genetics, for very long, that's not how evolution works. Evolution cannot work on individuals. It works on populations and variability over time. So we we do have to die and take our alleles with us to make room for new combinations in the new generation. That's what adaptability is. So that's why um, all animals and plants are programmed to eventually die and get out of the way. And in fact, the few exceptions we have where animals look like they're immortal, we always they're always the exception that prove the rule because of their unique situation and what they live in, they don't have the the same uh, genetic problems and and, and, uh, genetic constraints. So that's what, uh, that's the presentation I have for you today. I I hope I demystified a little bit about where we're going to go with with gene editing and gene technology. And I think it's an exciting time um, because the, at least the low hanging fruit of simple genetic diseases, um, there are, there are humans alive today who wouldn't have been, or who at least would have uh, had their debility debilitating diseases without this uh, technology. So I hope it, I I can't wait to see where it goes next. Dr. Lentz, that is, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Because I unmuted myself, but I can't figure out where my picture is, but that's not important. That is such (laughs) amazing, exciting information. And I'm thinking of family members with cystic fibrosis and Parkinson's and a friend with multiple sclerosis. And Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed amazed um yeah i think we are we're offering real hope uh for the first time uh to some of these diseases yeah yes yeah some of these that were just death sentences Mm -hmm. Um, and we always hope that facts and information will result in rational decisions and policy making so um i was monitoring the chat a little bit while you were talking oh there i am yeah, mm-hmm. take me off. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, somebody wanted to know: Are ALS and colorblindness things that are being looked at? To um, ALS for sure, um, because ALS also has a very well understood uh, etiology, and I think, and, and it's an immune response too. It's generally by an immune response. So I think that ALS will be one um, that we'll, we will see progress on fairly quickly. Um, I, for colorblindness, I haven't heard that just because I I, I think uh, generally it's not life threatening, so I don't think it gets quite the research attention um, that it, that it, you know would lead to that kind of thing. But once it be, once this technology gets developed, of course it will spread to other conditions and other uh, situations. So I think we're beginning um, with diseases that are not just feasible to cure, but that are also an important public health issue for, for, for people who are dying of them. So I don't think that you'll see that as a um, priority anytime soon, but it will naturally extend out of that. Okay. Um, you were talking about, oh, I hate it when I have a brain freeze. You were talking about all the different genes that affect height. And one of our um, former board members, we don't see him as much anymore. He travels a lot for work, uh, Dr. David Cregan. He and I talked about why is it so hard to come up with a drug that will tamp down the appetite? Uh huh. And what he told me, and I don't have much of a scientific background, so, um, but what he told me is there are so many pathways in the brain to keep us eating. It makes perfect sense. You yeah, know, it's it's evolutionary. So they are. There's a, it's it's very resistant to manipulation, and also 
it's also involved in some other pretty core parts of our metabolism. So messing around with our insulin and glucagon um, mm -hmm. hormones is not a good thing. It's almost always going to result in tragedies. Um, so, so it, because it is so central, that's, that's going to be one of the problems. Okay. Let me, uh, for those of you who are putting questions in, we appreciate it. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the scrolling function on that because my computer is not young. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I lost the question that Rob Palmer typed earlier, so I will paraphrase it. Um, and I have my own unprintable answer to this one, but what do we say to Christian, fundamental Christians who say this is going against God? I'm sure you hear that question a lot. Um, I haven't as much with, um, with, I mean, and there's a reason why I focus on these genetic diseases because we haven't had, um, there, there's almost no ethical uh, concerns with with trying to fight cystic fibrosis, trying trying to give someone a cure with cystic fibrosis. Um, I haven't heard anyone that would say that that goes against God's design any more than other medical treatments would. There will be some flavors of Christianity that will be against this, the way that there are some who are against transfusions and mm -hmm. some that are against psychiatry, some yeah. that are against... Very, so you'll always have that. And I can't imagine that, and it probably would be more aggressive. But I think by and large, the larger Christian community has made peace with most healthcare technology a long time ago. Um, so I can't see this would be any different. I, so I don't, I don't, I guess I don't expect any, any more than the usual um, mm -hmm. from this. And in fact, That's, and we've yeah. already faced that. You're, if you remember, HIV treatments were um, opposed by a fairly large amount of the Christian community when, when the HIV epidemic was largely focused on the LGBTQ community. Um, the Christians um, thought that it was, it was a, a fair retribution for sin and yeah, it was only, it. <laughs> yeah it was deserved and it was only when hiv started popping up outside of the lgbt community that sort of people begrudgingly were like well yes we got to treat this so again they're they're so the, the opposition that they had there wasn't anything about god's plan or the treatment it was just the individuals that were suffering you know didn't didn't um weren't worthy of of their compassion um, and so, but once, you know, it was really Ryan White in the United States that, that mm -hmm. changed that whole technology. So I, 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 I don't see a direct parallel because there isn't the moral, moral repugnance towards people with sickle cell or cystic fibrosis and things like that. So I, yes, I don't think, I don't think this will have any, any of the, except for the usual, very fringe resistance. And yeah. And the French people are always out there screaming and yelling and waiting, yeah. for whatever's okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, for those of you who are typing questions, I'm not going to list everybody's name, but I do like to recognize some of our long-term supporters. Scott Snell from Cap National Capital Area Skeptics, who's who's been a, a so we've been supporting each other's groups. Um, Nathan described the healthy test subject who died from a new treatment, and that was Philadelphia, right? Some years ago, did that? Happen? It sounds right, actually. I think I think it could have been. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, I was yeah. I was in college at the time. It was in the nineties. Yeah, I was in kindergarten. <laughs> um, are there any prospects for testing new treatments without human subjects ever being risked? Although it doesn't sound to me like what you were saying. It sounds like there's not much of a risk because of the way they're doing it. Yeah. So the way that CRISPR technology works, it is so much safer because it avoids it avoids viruses altogether as a delivery mechanism. And so in the 1990s, we were there were a couple of different viruses, lentiviruses, adenoviruses, adeno associated viruses. That was our the only way that we could think of the only way the only tool we had available for gene delivery, like to get to get an intended gene into a cell involved a virus. And so that was the problem. And once, but, but, but Casper Cas9, the, the package is so small. It's just so much smaller than what we had to deal with before um, that you have these uh, basically liposomes. It's not that much different than the COVID uh, vaccine delivery. That's the same kind of technology. So we can, we can make it much, much smaller. You don't need a virus. It's basically just a small liposome and it also goes away. So it's not like a self-sustaining infection or anything like that. It's really just like a one-time treatment, but the genetic material goes in there. 
uh, into the cell. So it's just orders of magnitude safer. And it complete, as far as we know, it's completely under the radar of the immune system. You really, you might get something at the injection site and, and, you know, just like you would any injection. Um, but it really is underneath the immune system's, uh, radar, the, 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 G, the, uh, the DNA, is that, is that the case there? Yeah. So someone's, um, sent the, the story that I was talking about. Oh, okay. So you can see the chats too. Yeah. A great. If, if there's yeah, one, there's... You wanna, yeah, if there's one you want to grab. Um, yeah, that's good to know. Right. So, um, anyway, yeah, so that, that was a tragic story and it, it set, set the whole field back. And it was really only until the CRISPR Cas9 came along before we we realized that the other the delivery this solves the problem of the delivery mechanism. So, so now you'll see these things moving much quicker. And I, I think that cancer is actually going to be the one that is a big turnaround because right now, um, you know, cancer treatments have been so slow to come up with. Besides like Gleevec and Herceptin, there's a few smart drugs out there. Tamoxifen, the rest of the chemotherapy arsenal are just horrible poisons, you know, nitrogen mustards, basically, that kill cancer cells a little bit faster than the rest of your cells. Um, and if we get the dose just right, we can kill the cancer before the treatment kills you. And, um, you know, that's where cancer treatment is for most kinds of cancer. Uh, early detection has been the big the big breakthrough. So people are, are surviving cancer now because we're finding it so much earlier, not because the treatments are much better. Um, but now that we have the ability, first of all, we can get your whole genome sequenced, you know, in two weeks for, you know, a thousand bucks. So now that we can sequence your whole genome of, of the tumor itself, we can give much more smarter treatments. Now, and then now we can deliver potentially genetic treatments. Um, I think I think we'll finally, Richard Nixon declared the war on cancer in the 1960s. Um, and really very little major progress has been done when it comes to treatment, except for Gleevec, Herceptin, tamoxifen and i really struggle to come up with and and there's some immune treatments but other than that it's really been mostly just early detection um has been the only real progress we made and 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 some dosing i mean you don't get near as sick you guys remember you know in, in the 1970s and 1980s you know you were you were completely sick as a dog with cancer treatment well we've gotten that a little bit better by tweaking doses um you know people don't get quite as sick as they used to but other than that yeah we're we're really primed for some some progress in cancer yeah well this and this this sounds I'm trying to think about 25 years ago an oncologist told me um and I, yeah i'm in south jersey so i'm very close to philadelphia he said if all of us and he meant oncologists don't lose a few patients a year. So he wasn't talking about one office or one doctor. He's talking about the, you know, the oncologists in the greater Philadelphia area. He said, if we don't lose a couple patients a year to the chemo, we're not treating it aggressively enough. Yeah. Wow. Then we're going to lose more people to cancer. So, well, that's a cheery thought. I'm sorry, everybody. Right. No, that's the, that's always been the balance is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but we're getting somewhere. Yeah, this question, and and you know, interrupt me if you see a question on there, Dr. Lentz, that you want to take. But this uh, this question came from Eric Krieg, who's you know one of our founding members. Um, what about modifications to increase all altruism, interest in learning, or less likely to become an addict? And actually, those are complete two completely different things because I have family members who are addicts, and wow, it's something's different in the brain there. So yeah. I'll let you take that. That's kind of philosophical. Um, well, once again, I would say that, first of all, the genetics of all three of those things you mentioned are poorly, if if at all, understood. Okay. So the yeah, idea yeah. that we could, tweaking behavior is going to be, is going to be just so far down the road because yeah. we don't even, the, the genetics of behavior is so poorly understood. Even when it comes to addiction, addictive behaviors um, tend not to be very genetically encoded. They're, they're not. They, there's some genetic predisposition, um, but the way it interacts with the environment seems to have so much more of a profound effect um, that I don't think genetic cures will be the way. Um, but actually, addiction. It's interesting that you mention addiction because the physiological aspect of addiction is finally getting somewhere. Um, because we used to really think that, you know, an addictive personality was an addictive personality and an addictive substance was an addictive substance. If, if animals got addicted to it, it was addictive. Well, what we realized was that the reason why mice get addicted to cocaine was because they live in a chamber 
with nothing interesting in it except cocaine. Yeah. And of course they got addicted to it. They got addicted to something that was making their life bearable, basically. And so when they put mice and rats in a much more natural environment where they have the kind of, especially social interactions that they're supposed to have, they have a much, they do not get addicted to cocaine, at least not near at the rate. Uh, because actually cocaine is very unpleasant at first, right? And, and almost all of these drugs are, are uh, you have to get over <laughs> Like cigarette, I was I was a smoker for years, but I didn't like my first cigarette. I didn't probably like my first 10 cigarettes. Um, you have to really want to get addicted to smoking. Um, and yeah. it's the same sort of thing. So we've looked at what kind of stimulation uh, an individual has. And, and basically an addict, you can think of it, addiction is someone whose needs are not being met. And I don't mean they need you know more warm hugs, but the way that their brain is being stimulated by the environment they're in. Um, and and once you grow up with that poverty of stimulus, you're not getting what you need from from your environment. And it doesn't mean that there's bad parents. It doesn't mean that they're they're all you know trauma. All that all those things make it worse. And that's why trauma and addiction have such a clear connection is because someone with trauma is constantly understimulated because of that. Anyway, bottom line is now that we're actually understanding a little bit about how addiction works, I actually think that you'll we'll start to see some physiological treatments, not just psychological ones, because psychological treatments, the reason they work when they do is because we rewire the physiology, you know, because you're, you know, your, your brain and, and behavior, they do affect each other. You know, the causal area works in both directions, how you act affects your brain as well. So once we figure out some of that, what works with addiction, the idea that we might be able to manipulate it without having to do all of that horrible uh, behavior modification, um, you know, we might get there. I don't see a genetic role there, but with other kinds of physiological stimulation, maybe. Interesting. Um, the MRA vaccine for COVID, it was 2023, when it was first out, I talked to somebody, I didn't know him, it was somebody in my neighborhood who seemed like an intelligent man. And he told me that his doctor, and I don't know if it was a chiropractor, a naturopath, an actual doctor, I don't know. And this was at least two years ago, told him that the MRA vaccine could affect, he had teenage children, could affect their ability to have children, which mm -hmm. was one of the nuttiest things. Mm -hmm. I, and yeah. I didn't argue with him. I just thought this is somebody who doesn't understand science. Have you heard yeah. that? Do you have a response to that? Was that ever a concern? Never. No, okay. not never. Never. It certainly wasn't um, for me. Right, right. There, I mean, there were some concerns. There's some very legitimate concerns. And and like I said, a number of us were were kind of nervous at first because it was new uh technology. It had it looked good and all of that, but it never get it never was out into the population. So some of the more rare side effects might not have appeared, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um but no fertility i never heard anything about yeah. that and, and by the way i'm i'm glad i didn't know that you scientists were nervous about it. <laughs> yeah yeah i no, mean it was but remember they did they did smaller scale studies before you know it came out but it was one of these things where um you know i i signed up to get the vaccine the very second that i could i don't i don't mean that it made me hesitant but it was you know it was a new technology and so for it to be deployed in the public as fast as it was um, you know, we really did kind of hold our breath a little bit. But as the data came back, um, besides making you feel a little crappy at first, um, the side effects have been, you know, nothing more than what we would expect normally from vaccines. And um, the effectiveness is just it blew everyone out of the water. The, the data is almost was, was almost looked too good to be true at first. Um, and the reason why you feel bad after a COVID shot, the mRNA shot is because the immune response is so robust mm -hmm. and every time you have an immune reaction you're going to feel like crap that's what the immune system does mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, and that is an intentional part of the of the immune system is it wants to keep you immobilized and the best way to keep a human mobilized is to make them feel bad make them feel uh sick uh, mm -hmm. and that's so that's why it does that that's a sign that your immune system is very aggressively doing something and in this case that aggressively doing something is generating antibodies um which is real a really good thing um but yeah that's why you know viruses 
you know, they don't want to make you sick. Actually, they want you up and about spreading. spreading. The virus, yes. Right. Yes. And so that's why the COVID most strains of COVID have gotten less severe as time goes on, because the less severe the viral infection, the more spreadable it is because the people yeah. don't stay in bed. They they're out, out, they go to work. And ideally it would become something like an adenovirus or, or other viruses where you have almost no symptoms. Um, that's the ideal world for a virus is, is yeah. not, you, not, not making you sick at all. <clears throat> Do you have any suggestions for how um, whoever advertises the vaccines? Do you have any ideas for marketing it better so people are less afraid? That's a question that came through. Yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, um, I, I really f- really um came to understand how poorly i understand my fellow citizens in 2016 i realized i don't know what this country is where where it is who i have no idea um yeah. where i've been living <laughs> I, feel that way. <laughs> uh, I, I was just such a and one thing though i i say when when the covid uh hysteria started you, one of the first things before the vaccines um came came about but when you know there's lockdowns and all of this the public health mes- messaging was like, you know, don't do it for yourself, do it for other people. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized that'll never work in the United States. Because <laughs> the idea that I would give up something to help someone I don't know, that is not American anymore. That is not an American value uh, to sacrifice something for the good of people that you've never met. Um, we just, we don't live like that anymore. And that's really devastating because there are lots of parts of the world where that's the, that is the prime argument in, in East Asia. If you, if you have even a little sniffle or a cough, you put on a mask when you go in public and they've been doing that for decades. And it really makes a big difference. If you don't feel quite right, you wear a mask and it does, the mask doesn't help you feel better. It helps you not spread it. It is a purely altruistic act. And we don't, we're not good at that here. So (laughs) <laughs> so I think the best way to help people is to is to package it as selfishly as you can. That will be the only way, um, you know, and that's in New York City. They they gave you a free meal. They they did all of this, these incentives because doing it yeah, for the good were, of for the good of other people just wasn't going to cut it. They were they were giving people money. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, another question. Somebody said, I've had six Moderna shots and never felt bad after any of them other than a sore arm. Does that mean it's not as effective if you don't? No, have- no, it doesn't. It doesn't. And in fact, the the correlation between how ill you feel and antibody production is not very good. So don't I'm worry about that. that. Don't, yeah, don't worry about that. But the yeah. fact that your arm is sore is a sign that it's doing something also, because those cells are now are are dealing with an onslaught of those liposomes and they're, you know, making up the antibody. So the fact that your arm is sore already shows you it's doing something, because if they had injected saline, it wouldn't be sore the way it was. So it is, you, oh. it, it is still a good sign. Um, it does. It does say something about you, though, that you might have uh, one of those immune systems that's not particularly primed for an aggressive um, what we call innate response, not the adaptive response, but the innate response. And I'm one of those two, actually. I don't, I'm not allergic to anything. You know, if I get bit by a mosquito, I usually don't end up with a welt. Um, I'm not allergic to even really to poison ivy. I mean, everyone is a little wow. bit, but, but I don't, I just don't, I, I always say my immune system is not easily fooled. What can I say? Um, and so, um, but you might be one of those. And, and I tend not to be a sickly person either. Like I don't get sick a lot. So I think, I think it's a good sign that you don't feel well, that you don't have really bad symptoms after the shot. Um, but for those that do, the comfort is that that means it's doing something. But if you don't have any, that doesn't mean it's not, if that makes sense. I, it does make sense. And I'm kind of relieved myself because I wondered, because I didn't have reactions to any of the COVID shots. I had a big time reaction to one of my shingles vaccines. Okay. But that's okay. You know, I, I, I'll i take those side effects rather than the actual. The actual shingles. Yeah. My, my mom said the same thing after her second or third COVID shot. She, she was really not, did not feel well for a couple of days. And she's like, I think I'd rather get COVID. But then oh, she no. got COVID. But then she got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> oh, it wasn't that bad, but she was like, you know, yeah. for a couple Ooh, of days, she, she really didn't that. feel well. well but what was cool is it only lasted a couple of days and then she yeah. was better. Interesting. And you had COVID. I right? did. Yeah. Like, I, read yeah. The I had it early on. Had, I, I read the article that you had published in, I think it was Psychology Today. Yeah. I got it in March of 2020. So when it oh. was... And it was a very scary time to have it because in Queens, I was, I live in the, in what we became the epicenter for New York city. 
wow. my part of Queens. Uh, and there were, you know, a mile and a half down the road from where I live is Elmhurst Hospital. That was one of those hospitals they were pulling up refrigerated trucks uh, to oh take to take the dead away. It was really kind of a scary time to have it. And I had no uh, vaccine, of course, and I was sicker than I've ever been for about three weeks, really. Um, and I had lingering, some lingering side effects for a couple of months. Wow. Um, so I was really sick. And then I got COVID again um, a year and a half later. And I mean, I didn't feel anything. I just, it, I tested positive, but I had basically no symptoms. Um, but it meant I couldn't fly. That was, I missed yeah. it. But um, yeah, cause I was, that was back when everyone was testing fairly regularly, even uh -huh. to go on a trip, you know, you were expected to test. And so I did, and I got, I, I must've picked it up. The whole family had it. And I, I felt I was totally fine. I would never have stayed home from work or anything like that. Uh -huh. with that. So that just goes to show how much protection the vaccine had given me. <clears throat> That's, that is amazing. I get every vaccine I'm offered. Yeah, me too. Oh, one. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome very this much. And, one and then... of the most interesting mm -hmm. talks, and we've had a lot of interesting talks. Um, I, I want to point something out to, to you also. We always have attrition during a meeting, whether it's face-to-face, -face, um, but especially on Zoom, if not during the meeting, during the Q&A, um, we lost one person. Oh. Really yeah. Well, thanks <laughs> everyone. <laughs> thanks for Power sticking around. Half. One person. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lentz's next book, Rewinding Sex, Modern Attitudes, Ancient Truths. Do you want to say anything about it? Um, well, or it's, a, it's, it's out. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'd love to say something about it. It's not going to be out anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, it'll, but it's an interesting book where I, I do take on the topics of sex, gender, and sexuality. And I, I approach them all from an animal behavior point of view. Um, and yes, even sex, I, I approach it from an animal, animal behavior point of view. And I, you know, I look at all kinds of different animals, but especially our closest relatives. And I look at how these are constructions uh, social constructions, even in animals, and they and how they all sort of make sense. And then I put human behavior within each one of these, and I think it's I think it kind of um, cuts through a lot of the politics. It, it, this is a book that I, I know will be used politically, but honestly, it's not really a policy or politics kind of book. It's just looking at behaviors and social behaviors in particular, and what why we do what we do, what what purpose does it serve, where does it come from. And I think it leads us to a point, I think, towards just non-judgmentalism in general. Um, the idea being that, oh, wait a minute, you know, a lot of this stuff is a lot more natural than we had thought. Um, it doesn't it doesn't automatically have a policy prescription. So I think people, no matter how they feel about these topics, can can approach it and still learn a lot. And I did that on purpose. I, I'm not afraid of politics and saying things, you know, that might get me in trouble. <laughs> but at the same time, I think that I, I, what I have been upset about in the conversation about gender, sex, and sexuality in the, in the country, in the world right now, is that biology has almost never been involved in the conversation. So little um, input from biology. You know, people talk about the psychology, the sociology, the policy, the politics, all of those other disciplines um, are at the forefront of this conversation. These are biological phenomena. Why are we not covering the biology? Why are not, why is biology not have a seat at the table for these topics, which are inherently biological phenomena. So I'm a little, I, I get a little irritated about that is nobody seems to be talking about the underlying biology of any of this. So that's why I, that's where I hope this book will contribute was to give people a biological basis for all of this stuff. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And I think it's because when people are preaching hate, they don't want facts. Right. And biology is facts. Facts. Yep. Sorry, I'm having a hard time getting that word out. We would yeah. love to have you come back in 2025 and talk about it. Let's do it. Um, so, I'll, you know, we'll I'll, I'll keep your contact information. Um, we always hope that facts and information will result in rational decisions and policies. That's what this group is about. We will see. Hope so. Um, just want to hold up my favorite my favorite book ever again. Is it? Yeah, my on the screen. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so for up, our upcoming meetings, 
Uh, in November, we're going to have Brian Foshi. One of our members found him online. He is going to talk about um, it's a journey into the realm of magic and how we are deceived. I really don't know what to expect from Brian, but he sounds very enthusiastic. In January, we will have Dr. Paul Halpern, has, who has spoken for fact multiple times, local professor and author. His book will be The Allure of the Multiverse, which will be available around the time of that meeting. Do you know, Paul? No, but I've heard of him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a Philadelphia guy. Um, so, Dr. Lentz, thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay. Um, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>